Okay, good afternoon and welcome to the 2024 Governor Candidate Forum. I'm Sue Racanelli, President of the League of Women Voters of Vermont. The League of Women Voters of Vermont is a trusted nonpartisan organization. Our mission is to empower voters and defend democracy. We do not endorse or oppose any party or candidate. We have five candidates running for governor of Vermont. Today's forum features three of them, Esther Charleston, Democrat, June Goodband, Green Mountain Peace and Justice, and Kevin Hoyt, Independent, Governor Phil Scott, Republican, and Poa Mutino, Independent, were invited but are unable to attend. The League is hosting today's forum with the Fletcher Free Library and CCTV, specifically for you, the voter, to meet your candidates, to hear what they have to say, and to ask questions on issues that are important to you. Now I'd like to call on Tom McCone, our moderator, to introduce the candidates. Tom is a former English teacher, principal, and library administrator who lives in Montpelier and writes commentary and feature articles for several publications. Tom? Thank you, Sue. Glad to be here. I love being in libraries. I'm kind of partial to libraries. So I decided I'd wear my name tag from, from when I worked at Kellogg Hubbard today. Has a person reading a book there. So <laughs> figured if I was walking through the library, somebody might ask me a question. But in this building, I might be lost. So even though we don't have internet in this room, one of the great things we have is we have all these beautiful photos by Senator Patrick Leahy. That um, he, this this show was has been on display in other places in Vermont, including at the uh, Supreme Court uh, building in Montpelier. Um, it's a beautiful collection. So if you haven't if you haven't already looked at the uh, photos, please take a look afterwards. So so this um, and thank you to the the Fletcher Free Library for hosting us today. So the process on this. The candidates will each be given two minutes for an opening statement, and at the end, two minutes for a closing statement. In the, in the middle, we have questions. Uh, the League has uh, two specific questions that we're going to start with. The candidates received the first question, and that's the only one they've had. And then there's another question from the League, and then I have additional questions from the League and from some community members and questions that I wrote. Um, we strongly encourage members of the audience to contribute questions. Some of you already have, and we hope that more of you will as this process goes along. Um, so that's the basics on that. We have a timekeeper in the front row to help the, the candidates keep track of uh, the two-minute limit. So that, would, uh, that will help us keep moving along. Candidates do not need to take the full two minutes. You certainly can, but it gives us a, if you take less time, then we get to more questions. But that's up to you. Uh, the candidates drew numbers to see who was going first, second, and third for the uh, opening statements. And after that, I have a rotating pattern, so it'll be, um, it'll be mixed up, so they're, not, they're going in different orders. But before I read the first question, I'll introduce the, the, the three candidates we have here today. And uh, we'll see how I do. This makes me feel very young, reading the text off my phone instead of off paper. But I have one of these on phone. So this is, uh, we, we asked the candidates to submit uh, short bios for me to read today. So these are written by the candidates. And uh, the first one is from Esther. A dedicated educator, a devoted working mom in a Vermont by choice, Esther Charleston embodies the uh, values of persistence, resilience, and advocacy. The eldest child of immigrant parents, she witnessed firsthand the virtues of hard work and the American dream, manifested by a mother who worked 80 hour work weeks to provide for Esther and her siblings. Esther has a, an undergraduate degree in history and communication, a Master of Science in Corporate Communication and Public Relations, 
and a Master of Arts in Teaching. While pursuing those degrees, Esther welcomed two beautiful children who each day teach her empathy, patience, and compassion. Esther chose to move to Vermont where her children received a quality education while enjoying a peaceful country lifestyle filled with fun outdoor adventures and visits to the local library and Saturday trips to farmer's market. As she pursued her career, taking on diverse roles in higher ed and in public school, the public school system, she ran a successful campaign for the Middlebury Select Board. In 1923, she, excuse me, how about 2023? <laughs> Uh, in 2023, she received a Leahy Award for exceptional leadership in the community. She currently chairs the State of Vermont's Commission on Women, a role that reflected Esther's dedication to creating a just and equitable world where every voice is heard and respected. Devoted wife, working mother, and change, and change agent and educator, Esther continues to weave her life experiences and principles into a tapestry of advocacy, hard work, and community engagement. And then next, June Goodband has worked for over 30 years as a counselor, supporting people's efforts to experience emotional well-being and live meaningful lives without addictive substances. She has seen how public policy affects people's lives and witness how str the strong influence of corporations on government has led to more and more people struggling to survive. She is not interested in helping people to adjust to a system that treats people like commodities to be used and thrown away. She is seeking election as governor of the state of Vermont because she believes that in this small state, we can make substantial changes that will send ripples around the nation. June wants to shift the focus of state government towards investing in people and communities and protecting our natural environment. We can do this by abandoning expensive strategies that don't work and creating vibrant and resilient communities together. And the third candidate with us today, Kevin Hoyt is an eighth generation native Vermonter from Bennington a lifelong conservation editor, uh, educator, excuse me, humanitarian and environmentalist. He is also a strong two-way supporter and advocate of constitutional law and safe streets. He is also pro-cannabis, pro-term limits, pro-common sense, and anti-corruption. Opioids are his main concern, and Kevin has the proven policy to lead Vermont and then the nation out of the opioid crisis. Education reform, judicial reform, tax reform, healthcare reform, sustainable farming, and giant leaps in economic growth and development are the other top issues, and he has policies for each of them. His policies and thousands of informational podcasts on his social are on his social media pages, particularly on his always free grassroots warrior network on Rumble. Kevin does not want to govern anyone, has solutions for redirecting our out of control government, and looks forward to making Vermonters proud of our great state again by limiting government and returning Vermont to the people. So thank you to the three candidates for sub submitting those bios for us to start with. So we're gonna go on to the two minute um, Opening statements at the end, the closing statements will be in the reverse order. But uh, Pastor is going first for opening statements. Hi, good afternoon all. I am Esther Charleston, and I am a wife, a mother, so grateful my two children can join me. I appreciate their patience, <laughs> as I know this is not their favorite thing to do. I'm a wife, I'm a mother, I'm a small business owner, and I'm a Vermonter by choice. I moved to Vermont a few years ago, and I remember at my interview thinking, wow, this is a place where I can raise my children and they can be children longer. 
And that desire for children to have that for not only my children, but all Vermont children has driven me to invest in my community, but also to run for governor. So how do I go from moving to Vermont a few years ago to now running for governor? Esther, make that make sense. And against the most popular governor in the United States. Those are the questions I get asked. Well, in choosing Vermont, Thank you, Jane. In choosing Vermont, I decided to get involved. My dream was to have a home, and I found a home here. And I did that by running for the select board. And I ran two successful campaigns. And I am currently, right now, the chair of the Vermont Commission on Women. I was appointed. And I, as I looked at Vermont 20 years from now, I began to worry that we are seeing some gaps. And we need to address them or bring it to folks' attention in a way where we challenge the current governor. And so I stepped in. Is it hard? Is this a Everest before me? Absolutely. And it's important to our democracy to name when we see some of the gaps in our state. Thank you. OK, thank you, Esther. June. Hi, I'm June Goodband. And I'm a candidate for governor because I want to represent the people who can't fund campaigns. There are two international crises that are affecting Vermonters and creating a lot of suffering. And the national government isn't dealing with them very well at this point. Climate change and the widening gap between the rich and the rest of us. And I want to go through each of those separately. With climate change, we do need to reduce greenhouse gases. We need to sequester as much carbon as we can. But we also need to prepare to survive the inevitable consequences of climate change. And that includes not only infrastructure challenges, but we need to create resilient communities with strong local economies and um, strong social support. And we need to increase our capacity to produce and distribute food locally. The concentration of wealth at the top means that a lot of people are experiencing hunger, homelessness, or economic insecurity. We need to make sure every person is able to meet their basic needs. And we can do this through responsible regulation and fair taxation to reduce the gap between incomes and the cost of living. For effective government to work, we have to work, the governor really has to work with the legislature and work cooperatively. Through that, we can find, an, find and implement effective solutions. Sorry, I'm not a polished speech, speaker. <laughs> Good job. Thank you, June. Kevin. All right, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to the library and the League of Women's Voters for giving me this opportunity. Uh, my name's Kevin Hoy. I hail from Bennington, Vermont. I am a born and raised native Vermonter. So I've spent my whole life here and I've seen the changes. Unfortunately, I don't recognize my own state anymore. Like most people watching this, I successfully avoided religion and politics my entire life. And then again, it's fight or flight. And historically, Vermonters don't make good runners. So I threw my hat into the arena like these two beautiful women. And thank you for that. Anybody that throws their hat in, I appreciate it. So again, at the beginning, you talked about, I didn't want to govern anybody, right? I want people to understand that. I think I have the heart, I think I have the policy to fix this, right? And again, give it back to the people. Um, I don't think you guys, you're Vermonters, you're great people. I don't think you need me or Phil Scott or anyone to tell us what to do. My plan is to govern an out of control system. And I think I have the policy to do that. So I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. So um, we'll go on to the uh, first question. So the, the three candidates received this question in advance. Uh, for this round, we'll, it'll be June, then Kevin, then Esther. And the question which they received ahead of time is, how will the state of Vermont fund infrastructure needs to mitigate and respond to climate events? So June? I got this question and I thought, the legislature 
is responsible for raising and appropriating funds, but they may look to the governor for some guidance. And the first guidance I would give would be to look to who's causing the problems. And I think the Army Corps of Engineers would be a great group to bring in since the US military leads the world in causing climate change. I think the uh, suing the fossil fuel companies for suppressing information about climate change is a great approach. And when it comes down to it, I don't know, but we have to find a way because it's necessary. We do have some funds from the federal government which are for rebuilding after disasters. And when we're doing that, it makes sense to size up for what's coming next. And we may have to add to those funds in order to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Kevin? Okay, I'm on the other side of the fence. I feel like I'm standing alone over here. My belief, and again, I think it's provable, that the climate is absolutely changing because it's being engineered. So one of my, uh, again, executive orders is going to be to stop the aerosol spraying chemtrails, right? Again, aluminum, barium, lithium, cadmium. Again, we've been sprayed for a long time. So I like Bobby Kennedy's idea. Again, uh, we're going to stop poisonous farming practices. And I believe in clean air, clean water, and clean soil again in Vermont. Weaponized food is something we have to look at, and it's all related. Um, but I've seen engines that run on water. I've seen engines that run on air. I think we have a big, bright, beautiful future ahead of ourselves as soon as we get rid of the bad guys. I don't think the problem is you because you're made out of carbon. I think the problem is our own government because we cannot afford them anymore. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Esther. Well, I believe climate change is real. And as I see the extreme weather that Vermont has been experiencing, I think about the flooding that has happened over the past two summers. I went to Barry canvassing, asking folks, and knocking on doors, asking folks, you need help? What do you need? How do we come together regardless of party lines to support each other? And guess what I, I saw and I see all the time? We are Vermont strong. When we are going through a hardship or climate change or whatever it may be, weather, I see us come together. How do we fund the help to make sure we mitigate? I say the legislature passed, and I'm gonna get it right, the Climate Superfund Act. Holding polluters accountable, and that money can help fund and make sure that we are prepared for what's next because it's not over and it's coming back, whether it be flight, flooding or extreme heat, whatever it may be, we need to be ready and proactive. And so also using the federal funds, but being wise with how we do that and to be prepared. Okay, thank you, Esther. So the next question, um, <coughs> it will be Kevin, then Esther, then June. And this question is, what will be your three top priorities if elected? Okay, and I'll, Kevin. I'm gonna go first again. I'll repeat for everybody and hope you're paying attention. I have a proven way out of the opioid crisis, which I think is, again, not only to relieve the overburden on our EMS and law enforcement and police and hospital and morgues, how many people need to die before we do something. A real close second is education reform. Again, I don't consider what we're receiving right now. Again, it's, it's Chinese core curriculum. As far as education, I think it's really easy. I believe in school choice. I think the future for education in Vermont State is private schools, home schools, and charter schools. It's as easy as the money follows the student. Now the money's the other problem. That $39,000 per student for some elementaries, it's a racket. We're being robbed, right? And then the last one, I guess, again, there's so many different things. I'll throw corruption in there. Um, I became a reporting party for our a uh, multi-state federal RICO investigation. And a lot of people don't know it, but we've been removing corruption for a long time, from matching illegal EIN numbers to PPP loans. Um, again, racketeering, right, RICO. We've all been racketeered. So I'd say those are my, again, clean up the corruption, make Vermont affordable again. I got a solution for opioids, and then we're gonna do something about education. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Esther. 
My three priorities are building climate resilient communities, education, and uh, attainable housing. Housing for all of us. Okay, thank you, Esther. Uh, my three priorities are meeting basic needs, and that includes food, housing, health care, and also includes education and making sure that every person can contribute according to their abilities. So that's, I count that as one basic needs, but I would start by implementing the universal health care law that Vermont already has on the books so that we can join the developed world and keep up with them where they pay half as much per person for health care as we do and have better outcomes. Thank you, June. So uh, the next question is about quality education. And the order will be uh, Kevin, June, and then Esther. And as we get into these questions, uh, you know, some of the priorities that the three of you have talked about are going to be coming up again, we'll have questions specifically about them. So the question on education, again, we'll be starting with Kevin, it is how does Vermont provide quality education for all students given rising costs, needed capital improvements, and the decrease in student population? Well, I think the, the increase in, or the decrease in student population goes to speak of exactly what I'm talking about. We have some of the highest costs in the nation for some of the lowest test scores. We should be ashamed of our education system here. And when you look at, you know, from, you know, the transgender um, initiation and in kindergarten and first grade to critical race theory, this is Chinese core curriculum. I think we need that out of our education system. I believe in school choice. Uh, I believe in local edu education for local students. And again, the cost is something we really have to look at. They're trying to pass it so that we don't have a choice anymore. Your property tax is just quadrupled in Vermont State. This is one of the reasons. All this free federal money we're talking about is not free. We cannot afford it. This is unsustainable. Uh, and again, I, I think the teachers' union is something else, and I know I'm, I'm going to get myself into trouble saying this stuff, but I think the teachers' union just adds to the overall expenses. So again, private schools, charter, charter schools, and home schools is, I think, the direction we're going, and I think Vermonters have already started that process. Um, again, if I had children that were still of legal age, they would not be in our public school system. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, June. I'm a strong supporter of public schools. I believe that we all need to learn basic, uh, basic thinking skills, as well as reading, writing, and arithmetic. We need to be exposed to ideas outside of our family and have choice, because children are not the property of parents. Children are members of the community from the day they're born. And I have wonderful homeschooled grandchildren, and I don't have any problem with them having been homeschooled. But I don't think we should expect parents who are usually expected to also work full time to be able to do full education for their children. And even if they do, they need the wider community. Um, if we lose support for homeschools, we will be sending children out to be indoctrinated in various kinds of schools. And with no supervision. Um, I'm speaking off the cuff. I hadn't thought about this a lot. And I don't know how to fund this. I know that we need to look at what actually works, what's actually needed, and what's just there because we have regulations that say it should be there. We've educated children for generations. We've found good ways to do it. Children need community. They need belonging. Thank you. Thank you, June. I would have to agree, community and belonging is very important. Right now, as our system stands, public education allows every student to have access to education. And to get a quality education, we need to make sure our public dollars, most of it is going to public schools. Because right now, that's where all students have access. And they are not getting everything that they need, as well as teachers. They are needing more support, administrators. So it takes a village. 
to bring up a child as you know, I went to the restroom and I had, thank you for watching my children who are here with me today. It takes a village and we can't do it alone. And so making sure that every child in Vermont has access to quality is the expectation and finding a way to make it work by working across the aisle is my priority. Okay, thank you, Esther. Uh, the, the next question is about unhoused Vermonters. In the order on this one's going to be June, Esther, and then Kevin. Uh, complicated question, complicated issue. So there are approximately 3,500 Vermonters who are unhoused. Uh, this week, local officials, local officials from around the state held a press conference in Montpelier calling on the governor and the legislature to do more to end the worsening problem of being unhoused. If you were governor, what would you do? And one of the questions from the audience parallels this and also specifically asks, especially what would you do for children experiencing homelessness or being unhoused? OK, so June. I would work to find more creative and innovative ways that we can find, provide temporary housing for people. And that would include giving support to people who will take someone in their home who would otherwise be unhoused, support and security for them, um, creating tent villages in the summer, um, making it safer for people to rent, to someone if they're gonna be gone all winter and there's a space open. Using abandoned buildings, I mean, not abandoned run down buildings, but buildings that are not being used right now for temporary housing, making it easier for churches to house people. And I would put most state money into stable, permanent housing for people. I would uh, use the VDSA, I think that's the right letters, no, VDA. Anyway, create something like a state bank so that they could give very, very low interest loans to people so that they can buy their apartment or their house, develop co-op housing, and find ways that people can move quickly into permanent or long-term housing. It is not OK for children or anyone to not know where they're going to be tomorrow. It's not OK to not know where your next meal is coming from. We need to make taking care of people a priority and find the funds, because we care about other people in our communities. That's what I have. Thank you, June. Esther. It's gut-wrenching <laughs> to think that sometimes we do miss the children. Who, are, who end up homeless, and we don't know. I know as an administrator at a middle school, I remember hearing stories being a part of meetings where we found out a student was homeless and we had to figure out services to support this family. So it's, it's sad and it's happening and it's all too real. As governor, I would definitely use a housing first model. So making sure people are housed first, and then we can figure out the rest. But guess what? Winter is coming. And the amount of homeless folks we have this fall is scary. And children are included. Where are they going to go? And as a government, can we turn a blind eye? No, we cannot. Thank you, Esther. Kevin. All right, I just I want to go back to the education one before I jump into this. I think we need to give control back to the parents, right? Again, what's happening in our school system is very, very concerning to me. As far as the homeless conditions, uh, again, this is a very complex issue. But if you look at the immigration policies, if you look at, again, uh, crime rates, what our homicide grew by 166% during the Phil Scott administration. If you look at these homeless rates, I think the state's uh, quoted number there, 3,500, is a lot less or a lot more. Um, there is more homeless people. Let me get that correct. There's more homeless people than they're actually alerting us to. And I think you gotta go back to the root cause. Um, so again, my, my opioid policy, 
It has a, a huge boost of economic growth and development, but on the return end, as we need stable housing for those people too, so they can be successful parts of the, of the community. So again, I think we need to cut the cost of living, which is i.e. your taxes. We need to provide jobs for these people. And of course, housing is vital, but right now, housing is very, very hard to get in Vermont. Affordable housing is non-existent. So as governor of Vermont, I plan on doing a lot of things in regard to that economic growth and development piece. And I think opioids is gonna be right in the middle of this. So we're gonna, we're gonna fund these people, we're gonna give them jobs, and then we're gonna give them homes. Uh, unfortunately, the kids are involved in this. Right now, what we do is our state fills up our motel rooms, right? And again, I know in Southern Vermont, where I'm from, I can't even recommend a hotel room for people when they come to Vermont anymore. What they've done is absolutely incredible, and they've turned them into drug houses. Right, so again, I think the crime, the opioids, um, the people that we're bringing into Vermont State, I think that's an issue. A lot of the homeless right now, I think, are transients. They weren't Vermonters to start with, um, but I know a lot of good people, and this could happen to any one of us at any minute, right? Most people are living paycheck to paycheck. They don't know how they're gonna pay their mortgage next week or keep the lights on. So this is a very complex issue, and I think it's got a complex answer, and I've got the policy, hopefully, to help out. Thank you, Kevin. Speaking of complex issues, we have health care. So there are a few questions from the audience and a, and a question that I had written ahead of time, too. These overlap a bit. We'll try to, so a, as you're responding to this, it's really, the, it's a whole issue of health care. Uh, like kind of a transitional question um, is someone asked, how is housing health care? This is a thought. How is housing health care? Um, one person in the audience asked how you, as governor, would implement the universal health care law that was passed in 2011. And then, the next step beyond that. So this week, and I, I don't expect that you will, would have read this 144-page report yet, but this week, um, a consultant issued a detailed 144-page report recommending sweeping changes to the Vermont health care system. One of the things in that report, it says that the 2011 legislation was not working. Uh, the report proposes repurposing inpatient units at some hospitals, consolidating services, moving some services out of hospitals, and changing how hospitals are paid. The report estimates that without changes, <coughs> the state will need to spend $2.4 billion to subsidize hospitals over the next five years. So again, I, I don't expect any of you have read that report in the last two days, but you may have heard about that coming out. But it does address this whole, the healthcare issue is a big topic and it's really complicated. So with those three questions that I threw out there, um, please feel free to go at the healthcare issue in you know, whichever, whatever way you would like that informs us about your thinking about healthcare. And this time, we will start with Esther, then it will be Kevin, and third, June. So Esther. Healthcare. Let's just pause, because it hits all of us. Not only the family, but the small business owner, but the school districts. It hits everybody, and we are all paying for it. And so the way it's set up right now is unsustainable. And this report reveals that we would have to make some serious changes. Do I believe we need to make some serious changes? Absolutely. And as governor, I would fight for that. Making sure that we create a model that's sustainable, where we're not all feeling the pressure. And I would look into maybe thinking about regionally. How do we not only look at our state, but different states? How do we come together? Because that's how we're gonna get through this. Not alone, not by ourselves. And it's important that we figure it out now or it's gonna cost us whether we want to or not. Thank you, Esther. Kevin. Okay, I just uh, was fortunate enough to return from Norway in January. If anybody tells you to go to Norway during January, bad time of year to go, right? But I experienced what we call the best healthcare system in the world. Everybody has healthcare, 
I have a friend over there who has stomach cancer, so he has to wait four months to see his doctor. And then once he sees that doctor, he's got to wait another six months before he sees a specialist. He dies in that time. So they have health care. Unfortunately, it's, it's not working over there either, right? So again, I don't know about you guys. I'm a typical Vermonter. Unless I think I'm dying, I don't even want to take an aspirin. And right now, I can speak for a lot of people in Vermont State. I am terrified of my doctor. I am terrified of my hospital. Again, we've done lots of reports on the adverse uh, adverse reactions to this medical experiment that we just had. Um, we've talked about Lyme disease. That's another U.S. bio weapon created by Eric Traub. Uh, get Lyme, Connecticut, right? Plum Island. So again, it goes back to our own government. But I think we have changes coming in healthcare. Um, the healthcare system, as we know it, I think is crashing. There's a lot of people that feel the way that I do. We have new technologies. We have new. Uh, there's color and light therapy, we have frequency healing, we have scalar technology, we've got the X39 stem cell patches. I think this gets into the spiritual piece also, where we go from political to spiritual, in disease, right, disease. I think a lot of it is manifested, we used that word before and I love that. I think you guys are powerful, all of you. I think we have the ability to actually heal ourselves to a degree with our mind. And it's really easy to show you the opposite way because I'm not good enough and I'm too ugly and I'm too fat and it never works out for me. And if that's what you're putting out there, again, you wanna decrease the number of COVID victims, stop testing, right? That's as simple as it is. So I don't trust the medical community anymore. And I think we have new technologies and things that are coming to open up that whole new world that you guys are talking about. And it's a whole lot cheaper. And guess what? It works, it works. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Kevin. June? I believe that healthcare is a human right. I also believe it's the job of the executive branch to implement the laws that are passed. And this law was passed in 2011. There's a good, clear proposal put forth by the Vermont Workers Center for how to fund it, which would save money for most Vermonters and immediately allow for changes in the healthcare system and how it's set up. Um, I realize it would take time to implement and restructure, but I'm concerned about small towns losing their ERs, losing their capacity to do any surgery at all. Um, I feel like we, we're lagging behind Cuba, which is largely seen as a third world country, and which has been under embargo for as long as I can remember, actually. Um, there's, there's not a need to pay insurance companies. They offer no added value. They offer a lot of boondoggle that's very expensive. And we can create simpler systems of payment. We just need to act on what the legislature and the governor at the time already decided. But it wasn't popular, so it wasn't done. And now, it's not that it failed, it's that it hasn't happened. Is housing health care? Absolutely. Having a place to live, waking up in the morning, having ready, steady routines, having security, that makes all the difference in a person's life. It makes more difference when you're ill. You know, I've talked to people who had open heart surgery when they were homeless. And they had no place to go to afterwards, but the hospital couldn't keep them. So they had to go into a, a homeless shelter in order to recover from their open heart surgery. <clears throat> we need to guarantee housing for people. And when people aren't eligible for federal housing assistance, we need to find a way to help them with housing assistance, particularly if they're disabled, because a lot of our homeless population is disabled. <clears throat> and housing is a prevention for substance abuse. If you have housing, security, community, and a way to contribute to society, you are much less apt to be, become addicted, stay addicted. If you have access to, uh, to treatment that you need, then you're also much likely, less likely to stay addicted. 
Thank you, June. The next question is going to be about child care, and the order will be Kevin, June, and Esther. And the question is about the lack of affordable child care, which is a problem for many Vermont families, whether they're single parent families or couples. Uh, so it's a serious issue. So what would you do as governor to, uh, to work to uh, reduce the problem of affordable, lack of affordable house care? Health, uh, excuse me, child care. <laughs> You, okay. said, you said it was me for the time. Okay, I wasn't making. Wanted to make sure you were looking over that direction. I didn't want to jump yes. out of line here. Again, this goes right back to the education issue, and I, I have this, you know, um, conversation with a lot of Vermonters all the time. And there's two of us working three jobs. We're only working 36 hours a week, and we don't get any benefits. And how do we do this? We can't stay home. If you, if everybody did this, no students right? Means no schools. You just saved 85% of your taxes. And I believe in education. Are you guys sending your kids to schools for, as a daycare center? Or is it so they can get a head start on life? Because that's my question. I love the three R's, arithmetic. I don't know, reading, writing, arithmetic. But I think we got to get back to that basics. And to defend our teachers, um, you know, the, the amount of curriculum that they are teaching today is over the top. They have enough that's all jammed into this little tiny school year. But what we're teaching I think is, is very, very vital. And again, as far as the health or the child care for parents, I mean, I, I'm an old school guy. I love, you know, the, the man goes out and works and mom stays home. And a lot of people aren't for that. Maybe the dad will stay home this time and mom goes out to work. But I love the idea of having a parent home to raise your own children instead of paying someone else, right? And it goes back to that cost of living again, you know, as a, as a, a double, you know, family, which is rare, I think, um, I think we're like it's at 56% for single parents. And if you're a single parent out there, it's had a hard enough time making ends meet and you don't have another person. But it goes back to the village. Uh, again, we need to support each other. Unfortunately, we've looked to our government to do this for decades and decades, my whole life, 54 years for me, and it's not working. We've watched it fail, we've watched it get worse, right? They had one job, one, and that was to protect you. Do you feel protected? Does anybody feel represented? Because I don't, so I see all new system reforms, anything system, the education system, the tax system, the every system I think needs revamping. And again, it's not you because you're made out of carbon, it's them, we cannot afford them anymore. And the amount of fat that we can trim off our budgets. I believe I can take a couple billion with a B right off the top. Why does Vermont State have billion dollar budgets in our education systems? Mount Anthony High School in little old Bennington, Vermont, is talking about budgets with a B. There's something drastically wrong here, guys. This is another racket by your criminal government, and as governor, I plan to end that. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, June? <coughs> um, I think that one of the basic needs people have is to be cared for when they can't take care of themselves. Whether you're a child, or an ill person or an older person that's at the point where you can't care for yourself, we need to make sure everybody is cared for. And in order to do that, we may need to include people who we might not think of as the usual teacher. And we can have childcare centers where people who have, are on disability can come in and help. We can expand assistance. We can have retired people come in and help, but we need to fund childcare as long as we expect both parents to work. I would love to see a system in which we could afford to have one parent stay home with a child, at least until they're two or three, but that's often not the case. In fact, I would say it's usually not the case. Families struggle and we need to support families because the work that they're doing is really important. And I don't think we're recognizing the importance of, or we may recognize it in our personal lives, but I don't think the government recognizes the importance of giving children the opportunity for positive connections, multiple relationships, and a sense of belonging in their community. So I don't, can't tell you how we'd fund it, but I gotta say, we have to fund it. Thank you, June. Esther? 
As a mother myself, I know how important childcare is. And I've always been a working mother. So having childcare has been important. And during my time on the select board, I, was, I had the honor of being a part of the Otter Creek Expansion Project, where we expanded the daycare center that we had in town, allowing more children to be a part of it. Because I remember I had one, uh, one child in one daycare and the other in another daycare because there was not enough room. And I had to drive 20 minutes before work to make sure both got to their respective daycares. So I have experienced the importance of childcare and the need for it. And how do we pay for it is really important. And so I know the legislature has been working really hard to figure out ways to make that happen. And as governor, I would support those methods, supporting the programs that really help folks who can't afford it, because it has become almost really expensive. Over $300 a week to put your child in childcare. So what do you do? So having supporting those programs that help parents and letting parents know that they have options so they don't have to feel stuck would be important to my Thank you, Esther. Um, and then next time around here, this will be June, Esther, and, and then Kevin. And this, we've already talked about unhoused Vermonters, but also people who are living in houses and renting houses and owning houses uh, it is really a stretch for a lot of people. And the issue of not having enough housing for people in Vermont is very serious. As governor, what would you do to alleviate this problem? So June 1st. I alluded to this earlier, that I would support developing a state bank that gave loans for people building homes that match the overall goals, energy efficient homes, homes where people have connection in community and where resources can be shared, like a co-housing sort of situation. Um, and the, the loans would go directly to the people who would be owners, not to the builders. If they're owner or builders, that's great. But we need to have a way that we help people build the kind of homes they want to live in and the kind build the kind of communities we need for Vermont to stay strong going forward. Um, so that's one aspect of it. I think we need to be careful as we go for, towards building homes that we not put people in what looks like file cabinets, that we let them have full lives, and also that we mix, um, have mixed income housing that we don't want to lock people into an identity that is based on how much money they have. How much money you have can change over your life. At one point, you might be struggling. At another point, you might have plenty. We need to allow for that. And we need to have people able to help each other out and be in community and not be defined by what their income level is. So I'm sure I could say more, but that's what came up. Thank you, June. Okay, Esther. So attainable housing is a platform that I choose to run on. And so that means housing for everyone. So that means the renters are able to find a place to rent. That means folks who are retired and have and are on fixed incomes and have homes can stay in their homes. So it's not only having folks having a home, making sure they have housing, but staying in their housing. So supporting programs that allow us to do this. And it's multifaceted. So yes, we need to make the investment, but right now we have regulatory barriers and we need to make sure that we're allowed to take older buildings and maybe transform them and use them differently. And being on a select board, I know what those regulatory barriers look like. So working with towns to make sure we can not only invest, but change those barriers so that we can have mixed housing and different options so everyone can thrive here, from the renters to the owners, everybody. Thank you. And Kevin. And again, I, I love the idea of, of housing everybody, but that's an immense amount of money ladies and again we have to 
develop and balance all that, right? But I think, again, the root cause of this is the government and our cost of living. We cannot afford this unsustainable. If you bought gas or groceries, that leads to, can I pay my mortgage also? And this opioid epidemic that we're talking about, I know in Bennington, we average about an overdose a day, between 25 and 35 overdoses. When I started this plight back in 2019, we averaged 19 deaths per 100,000 Vermonters. That's just the deaths, not the people that go with that. Today, 2024, we're up to about 36. That's unacceptable. And again, this overlying burden and expense, I think directly leads to the homeless population. As part of my opioid policy, I wanna treat that part of our society as a sick part of society rather than a criminal part of society. The money's already there. Again, they followed this, I'm um, following Portugal and Holland. They reduced, again, overdoses by 85%, heroin usage by 75%, drug use by 56%. Crime went down by over 400%, right? And again, a large majority of our homeless population, not everybody, please don't make this stereotypical, a lot, a large portion of that is addicted, right? So part of my policy includes aftercare program, Right now what we do is we throw them, well, we Narcan them 10 times, we send them to rehab 45 times, we're paying to put them in jail, and then eventually we pay to put them in a coffin, right? Portugal's found out that you not only save money, you save lives. So part of that, again, you got treatment, you got family support, you got mental health therapy, you got every aspect, and then aftercare, sober living, where these people actually have an adjustment where they can get back and be successful parts of society. So I think that would alleviate our, our homeless population, our housing crisis. And again, it goes back to your government and the fact that we can't afford them anymore. Like the cost of living right now is beyond unsustainable. That's what I'm saying. Any one of us could be homeless tomorrow, right? You lose your job, you get laid off, any of these things happen and there's nothing for backup. The government has all these policies and solutions How's it working for you? Why is our homeless population still growing? Why are we still, I mean, our overdose rates, we double, triple by three or 400% every single year. How many of our friends and neighbors need to die before we actually do something? Phil Scott's not interested. As far as I could tell you, our legislators are not interested. And I think that underlying problem is the biggest thing we face as Vermonters and as a nation, and I've got a way out of it. So I think that's gonna help all of our situations and all of our problems. Back to the ladies. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Kevin. And the, the next uh, question is going to deal with cost of living. Um, and the order on this one will be Esther, Kevin, and then June. And uh, I mean, we've already talked about quality education, health care, child care, housing, being unhoused. And um, all of these relate to the cost of living. Question from someone in the audience is, as governor, what policies would you advocate for to address the cost of living in Vermont? So Esther is first. I would say the cost of living is outrageous. Rent is really high. And I have, as I've been on the campaign trail talking to different people who are like, I don't know what to do, and I don't know what to do now. <laughs> And so having a solution is important. And how do we change folks' everyday life? So it's just not up here, but it can impact their everyday life. So I would support policies that would do just that, that supports everyday life for folks, whether it, it hits housing, healthcare, childcare, whatever it is to help folks live every day and be okay. I think about groceries. The, the cost is too much. And so how do we make it so that we can all? Thank you, Esther. Uh, Kevin. Okay, again, we're gonna go back to government corruption. In Bennington, we have the Bennington Battle Monument. We just put a $300,000 fence around it. We're missing about $296,000. We've got a $100,000 pocket park, 5,000 bucks, and the Boy Scouts, I would've gave you a heck of a pocket park. Right. If you look at the cost, again, I'm speaking just from Bennington, southern Vermont. We have a $56 million Putnam project. Are the cabinets gold lined? 
You know, when you lose your family farm, your business, your home, how come it ends up with the judge or the senator? You look at the largest property, property owner in Vermont State, it's Vermont State. It's your town, right? So again, I think the underlying cost and having to do with uh, our taxes and everything that affects us today is our government and the frivolous spending and the straight up fraud. It's corruption. We've been nailed again. We've got a, a $78 million welcome center in Bennington. The town of Bennington lies to the state of Vermont, tells you we get 1,000 visitors a day. It's not even remotely, you know, $78,000 for a welcome center. The building's assessed at $350,000. What happens to all that money? Or let's talk about you know the city of Burlington. Here we are in Burlington today. Burlington dumps between three and five million gallons of raw septic into our largest fishery every single year, Lake Champlain. You guys heard of the blue green algae, right? It's not algae. You guys need to look that up. It's human feces. So it's a government created problem. Their solution is to restrict us. Your beaches are closed again. And guess what? They want more money because there's more, excuse the French, there's more shit in our lake. And I can say that because that's actually what it is. Do you guys care? The state of Vermont through Fish and Wildlife spends about $50 million a year. We got tens of millions of dollars through Lake Champlain International trying to figure out what's going on. Maybe it's our government jumping feces into our lake, right? So again, if you want to cut the cost of government or cost of living, you cut our government. So I almost used to feel treasonous for saying this. But my job and my goal is to get in to take this system down. And as governor of Vermont, I plan on taking this job or taking the position, I should say. I'm not going to take the job because I believe it's a fake corporate government and that would be against executive order. So I'm going to do this for free because it's the right thing to do. I've got several executive orders coming. One of them happens to be term limits because I don't see them writing themselves out of a job. So we're gonna mandate that, not only for the elected officials, but for the appointed officials too. Then I can go back to deer hunting. Thank you, Tom. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Uh, the next question is going to deal with, I didn't, oh, you didn't go, I'm sorry. June, yes. Okay, <laughs> so I think a big driver of cost and unaffordability right now is the cost of housing. In the last four years, rents for most people have doubled. And that's not right. It's not because it's more expensive for the landlord to hold that place. It may be a little more expensive. The taxes might be a little higher. Repairs might be a little higher. But it's not phenomenally more expensive. What we've had is out-of-state people coming in and buying up rental units and renting them and being out-of-state where they don't even pay taxes on the income they get from it. And that's caused in-state landlords to say, gosh, they can get 1500 for that little apartment? I can do that too. And rents have just gone up astronomically. I think we need to control rents. I think we should roll it back to what it was in 2020 and then add maybe 10% or 15% and then regulate how much they can raise them after that. We can make adjustments if someone wants to do vast improvements on their building, but we need to keep people in their homes. It's understandable that when rents rise and incomes don't rise, people are gonna be homeless. And people being homeless makes everything cost more. It's very expensive to eat when you don't have a kitchen. It's expensive to do everything. Yes, we have higher, higher food costs, and I'm not sure if that would be alleviated immediately by building a local food economy, but I think it would increase the quality of the food and it would increase the reliability of the food. As climate change takes hold, we're gonna lose the access to some of the food resources from the rest of the country, and we need to be prepared for that. We have arable land, former dairy farms mostly, and some current dairy farms that are no longer profitable, that could be used to grow a lot of food and really enough to support Vermonters. Um, we could, if we shifted to primarily plant-based food, we could cut our methane and nitrous oxide emissions. I'm off topic. Affordability also means increasing incomes to match increasing costs. And I think we need a livable wage 
and it should be required. We need to support small businesses and self-employment, and there's no reason why one person is worth so much less than another. We, we all have valuable roles to play, and everybody needs to be compensated for their time and their work. Thank you. Thank you, June. And thank you for catching me. <laughs> the uh, next uh, question will be about injection sites, and the order will be Esther, June, and Kevin. And the audience member asks, what is your opinion about creating safe injection sites within the state? So, Esther, you're first. Kevin has talked about the op opioid crisis. And that I agree with you, Kevin. It's something that we're struggling with as a state. And folks are needing support in different ways. So as governor, I would support ways to make sure that people get the support they need, whether it be a counselor or whether it be medical attention. I would support that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And June. I understand substance use disorder is an illness. And I look at, I, I actually agree with Kevin on this one, although I would add that we also have a massive number of deaths every year from alcohol addiction and from tobacco addiction, and that we need to look at addictive substances as a group. And it's not right that we say this substance is bad and this one's okay. We need to look at addiction as a problem and we need to treat it as a problem. And we need to start with prevention which means secure, stable lives with lots of social support and the medical care you need. Beyond that, we need harm reduction because some people who are addicts aren't gonna quit right now. Whether they're addicted to alcohol, heroin, <clears throat> methamphetamines, whatever they're addicted to, they aren't gonna quit today. They aren't ready to. I think all of us have experienced this. There's times when we say, hey, I need to lose weight, but that doesn't mean I'm going to start tomorrow. I might need to wait a little while before I really get to the point where I'm ready to do so. And keeping them alive so that they can make that choice is an important thing. So yes, I support all kinds of harm reduction, including legal injection sites. I think making sure that what people are injecting is safe would be a big step. Um, I'm reminded of during Prohibition, people were using sterno and dying. Um, I mean, prohibition of alcohol. We should have learned from the alcohol prohibition that prohibition doesn't work and that more people die. Thank you, June. Kevin? Wow, I love the unity, first of all, because I think this is the number one problem that faces Vermont and the nation, like I said. Now, personally, safe injection sites by themselves are a horrible idea. If we do this piecemeal, it's not gonna work. We have to do the whole, the whole shebang all at once, and in that case, I am. And again, Portugal, they use this, they had a needle exchange student, or exchange program too. And Americans, we had a real hard time. It didn't make any sense to us. And then you start listening to the teachers over in Portugal. They removed a million needles from the streets. And again, they couldn't send their kids out for recess. And really what happened in Portugal, again, back to medical, is the, the spikes in AIDS and Hep C. And if you look at HIV right now, again, not just in Vermont State, but across the nation, those are spiking. We're seeing the same thing. So I'd love to follow... Portugal's lead, but we're all addicts. You're absolutely right, whether it's you know work or our cell phone. How many people are addicted to your cell phone now? Me too, right? And uh, alcohol, cigarettes, there's, there's a million different things. So I still have a lot of compassion and sympathy for those people. I think that was another setup. And when you start talking about methadone and Suboxone and all these other things, that's big pharma back to the medical community, right? And you'll see the real evil intent here. Those things, right now we, we spend about a trillion dollars a year as a nation for a 1% success rate. And that's the people we get on Suboxone and Methadone. We're getting an average of 15 years out of them before they die too. And it's harder to get off of, it's just as dangerous, 
is the regular, you know, street drugs we're gonna tell them. All we did is we switched from this set of drugs to that set of drugs. And as soon as you guys start realizing big pharma, big politics, and uh, big corporate are all, that's our three-headed beast, right? So I think at this point, again, we need to think outside the box. Portugal has already set the world precedent. Holland is finished. And I think that's how we do that. But it's got to be complete package. If you do it piecemeal, we're opening up the door to drug dealers. And that's why prohibition doesn't work. That's our government, too. They're making money on this, just like there's no money in the cure, right? But keeping us sick forever, lots and lots of profit. So that's where I stand on that issue. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Kevin. Um, the next uh, question is going to deal with voting security, and the order will be June, Kevin, and Esther. And there are a couple of different questions that came in about this. Um, one is, is voting secure in the state of Vermont? And then uh, are there any towns in Vermont working to clean up their voter rolls? Are there ever regular audits of them? Okay, so again, uh, June 1st. I don't know of towns in Vermont that are trying to clean up their ro voter rolls. There may be some. I am, I believe that in Vermont we have a fairly fair and open system. We use paper ballots that get counted by a machine and then are available for recounts. So I'm pretty confident in the Vermont voting system. I know that people may disagree with me. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, this is where my adventure starts. In 2018, I took part in an old school manual audits in Bennington County. So I can only speak for Bennington, but I took 5,500 names and 5,500 addresses. I said, is this one real? Is this one real? And do they match? I released over 500 fraudulent names and that was just the A's and half the B's, right? So I do not believe elections are, are controlled or real. And if you recount the same cheated vote, you get the same number. So again, I went through, we spent over a thousand hours doing this. It's 2018, it's a long time ago, but we'll jump forward, 2020. Again, um, you mentioned Governor Scott, the most popular governor in history. In 2020, Vermont had 102% turnout. We actually had more ballots than legal age voters. So Houston, we might have a problem, right? And even better than the crime, we have the cover up. I've got two documents on their letterhead and their words with their signature on the bottom. No one ever looked. That's why our Secretary of State, Jim's Condos is missing. Not only his meetings with Juan Ping, the consult general for the Chinese Communist Party, he was also in charge of the EIN numbers. We have a bunch of matching EIN numbers. I'll give you guys one, the Vermont Sheriff's Association. Everybody in this room has a sheriff. Why does his number match Judge James Colvin's nonprofit, the Mount Anthony Preservation Society? That's one of many. We live in a society of shell companies and it's set up for money laundering and embezzlement. And again, I think the elections are really, really bad. Vermont State doesn't even handle our elections. Most people don't know that. Your Secretary of State doesn't touch a single ballot. They're all done out of LHS management, which is a subsidiary of Dominion out of Salem, New Hampshire. We've got the serial numbers, we got the Dominion, the Hammer scorecard. Again, the evidence is overwhelming, it's solid. The problem is we can't get our elected officials to look at election fraud. Go figure, and like I said, even better than the crime. We've got the cover up. I'd be happy to share that information with everybody. I've done that. Unfortunately, your media isn't interested in printing those stories. Again, the media, in my opinion, is going with them. We can connect a lot of these things. And again, for examples, in Bennington, we have another shell company called Sunrise Daycare. Our taxes pay for it. Not only does it have a matching EIN with Judge James Colvin, it's got what the FBI calls a pedophile symbol in their logo. It's a child advocacy center run by the Vermont Department of Children and Families. If you follow the money for that, um, again, there's so many different connections with these other illegal shell companies, and it, the real connections are between our attorneys, our lawyers, our judges, and our prosecutors. And I became a reporting party for our multi-state federal RICO investigation back in 2019. They told me to tell my sheriff, it's Bennington County Sheriff Chad Schmidt, right? The charges on the BOLO, that's a statewide issue, law enforcement, be on the lookout. The charges were human trafficking. 
drug trafficking, murder, obstruction. This is your sheriff. You guys should be concerned. We've identified a second human trafficking ring in Paulette, Vermont. Again, Merrill Bent is an attorney. It's a bad, bad apple. Her business partner was Rob Wilmington. Rob Wilmington is the guy that set up all these illegal shell companies with James Colvin. Rob Wilmington covered up sexual misconduct with children at that same child advocacy center with a matching EIN and what the feds call a pedophile symbol. Right after he retired, he went on to run Vermont Digger. You guys probably know that name, right? It's largest news publication in Vermont State. You should look into Rob Wilmington. Merrill Bat is his business partner. So again, I, I think there's a lot of serious issues going on in Vermont State, and until we get off our butt and do something, they're going to continue. Thank you, Kevin. Esther? Voting security. Right now, our current Secretary of State State, Sarah Copeless Handis, I think I got that right, and um, is doing awesome work to making sure that we are, that our voting is secure. I learned that there's uh, um, audits that are done constantly to make sure that we have secure voting. And do I trust that system? I do. Thank you, Esther. We have uh, one more question, and then we'll move on to the closing statements. And for this last question, the order will be uh, Kevin, Esther, and June. And here's the question. The combination of a stagnant population, a shortage of workers, and a shift to more older residents are creating numerous challenges for Vermont. How would you, as governor, address these issues? So we start with Kevin. Again, I think it goes back to economic growth and development, and there's another underlying problem here in America, which is surrounding sterility. It goes back to those biological weapons that we talked about, right? So it is a problem. We're not breeding fast enough in Vermont. That's where we bring in, again, all these outside people because it's an issue. As far as, you know, jobs, that's, again, Governor Phil Scott. He not only killed our economy, but he killed our grandparents, our veterans, our seniors, Right, so I think through the policies that I have is the way to, to solve that, that issue. I think that's it, and, and again, if I just, I wanna end on the voting rolls too, because it, Vermont has never ever done an audit of our voting rolls, ever, in the history of Vermont. It's never happened. So what we're watching when we go back to that election sheet, I was down in Orlando, Florida with Juan Osaban, Tim Cordova, Seth Kitchell, some big names, and uh, we were watching the 2022 cheat in real time. The population in every state was growing by hundreds of thousands or millions of people where they infl inflate those voter rolls. And then after they vote, they don't think anybody knows about it. But we've been watching this for a long time. So again, I think government corruption is the underlying problem. It's the underlying cost. And that is what is oppressing Americans and Vermonters alike. I planned on ending it. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Esther? I think about our young people, getting them to stay in Vermont. So making sure that they have options. If they don't wanna to go to college, they can go to a trade school and become plumbers and stay here. Plumbers make a lot of money, I'm really impressed. I'll be <laughs> honest, or become a firefighter or what have you. So making sure that the people who are already here have options for jobs. And then recruiting families, young families and young folks to come to Vermont and really contribute to our economy. I'm one of the people who, I'm from Connecticut, but came here and said, wow, this is a beautiful place to have a family and raise a family. And I know more would feel the same, so making it possible for them. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. And June. Um, I agree that we need to keep more people in Vermont, and I think we need to make education post high school available. Vermont is close to the bottom in supporting post-secondary education. And I, my grandson ended up going to Keene State because it was cheaper than going to any Vermont school. And he lives in Vermont. Um, it's a struggle for people to get college educations and stay here. And trade school, we need to cut some of the barriers so that people can try out an apprenticeship without making a big monetary commitment 
before they start because they don't get paid much as apprentices. And really, plumbers make a lot if they are owners. If they're not owners, they get paid better than your average grocery store clerk, but they aren't paid that well if we look at what it really costs to live in our country. So, and I say this because of having a relationship with a retired plumber. <laughs> but, but the trades are important. It's important to have all kinds of workers here. And I think we attract people when we have jobs that pay well and that pay enough so that people can live here, which hasn't been happening lately. And um, when we support small businesses, support people in developing small businesses, and in building strong communities where people want to live. And I welcome people from Connecticut. I welcome people from Venezuela, from Guatemala. I welcome people who come here to work and live. And I don't care where they're from. They have the ability to make a contribution and be part of our society. Third class Connecticut oh, in with that. No, that's all right. <laughs> Connecticut's part of it, that's all right. Thank you, Jim. So for closing statements, uh, these are two minutes long, up to two minutes. And uh, we're going to go in the opposite order that we did for the opening statements. So it will be Kevin, then June, and then Esther. Okay. So closing statements. Kevin. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming and listening. And you don't get to see Esther's kids over here. But yeah. my dad told me a long time ago, you can tell a lot about a man or a woman by their dog and their children. And these are the most, the cutest, most responsible. They've been a... So hats off to you as a mom. <laughs> so I, I got kids too, and I, I can't get them to listen, so thanks. But I think the way we've been doing things in Vermont State hasn't been working, right? And I, I think we can kind of all agree on that. Again, politically, we've got a lot of different opinions, but I, say, I saw a lot of unity tonight, and I think we all know we're in trouble, and we're heading towards that same common goal. And um, it's good to see fresh faces get into this. Because those old faces, that old, I think that's a dying breed. I think this, this government that we know, my theory is it's over. The government that we all grew up with and knew, I think it's over and it's never coming back. But I like to predict the future by making it. And hats off to you guys and everybody. I'm getting a lot of people are watching. We're actually doing now. So we talk a lot about corruption and all the bad things that are going on in our lives. And, you know, when you're talking about you know, issues and problems in Vermont. We don't have to search for content, right? There's a lot of things that are going on that are affecting every one of us. So I love the unity. I think I've got some serious policy um, and I hope Vermonters look at that policy. It's not just hollow promises. I want world peace. I do want world peace. But I believe in, again, Vermont strong means we're all in this together. And you don't have to be a Vermonter to be Vermont strong. All we really have is each other, and that's also how I know we're going to be okay. So I appreciate your time, ladies, and Tom, and the League of Women's Voters for having me. I hope you check out my policy, and remember to vote. It's important, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. And June. I'm not sure if it came across, but my central theme is that I think we need to invest in people and communities. And that by doing that, if we make sure people have their basic needs met, have strong social relations, and have a responsive community, we will save both lives and, and money in the long run. I'd rather pay for people to have housing and help them get their basic needs met and find jobs than pay for them to be in jail or go through the court system. And when I think about investing in people and communities, I think we need to make things a lot simpler. And I have a whole plan that I'm working on by asking people for their input. A blueprint for effective governance for Vermont. And in that, I talk about community care teams, which is uh, from all the agencies where people already are there to help. We're, meeting in one place where a person can walk into the one place or call the one place and there's cross training. Everyone knows every program that's available and every grant that might be able to be used. 
and they can individualize the response to a person's problems. It's not, I fit in this particular box, you know, you're $2 over in your weekly income, so you're not eligible for this, or you're not eligible for that. Find a way to let people stay in their homes, afford to care for their children, afford food, afford what they need, and make a long-term plan to help them to be able to do that on their own. Thank you. Thank you, June. And uh, before you go, Esther, I just want to comment, because June, you said you weren't sure if it was clear. One of the things I have appreciated about this forum very much is I think all three of the candidates have very clearly expressed their views on things. And that, that's very helpful to voters to see that. So thank you, all three of you. And Esther, now your chance for your closing statement. Yes. So I want to say a special thank you to the League of Women Voters. Thank you for hosting this. Thank you for having us. Thank you to the library for allowing us to be here. And a huge shout out to my children. Thank you, Kevin, for recognizing, because I know this was hard for them, but they are here. This is what I want to say. Vermont is a beautiful place. Vermont is an incredible place. And we want to make Vermont a place where everybody can thrive, from those who just got here to those who have been here for generations, renters, homeowners, children, families, everyone. And to do that, it's important that we prioritize making sure our communities are climate resilient, because climate change is real and it's not going away. And we need to prepare for it, making sure our education is our public education is quality so that children can have what they need to move forward and, of course, attainable housing. Making sure that everybody can have a place to stay and stay in that place. Not only get a home, but keep a home. And so I am invested in Vermont for the long haul. So thank you for having me. And please, if you want to learn more, visit EsterForVermont.com. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Esther. Thank you, all three candidates. I'm going to turn this back over to Sue Racanelli from the League of Women Voters. We are delighted that you joined us this afternoon and hope this forum gave you the opportunity to learn about the candidates for governor. On behalf of the League of Women Voters, I want to thank the candidates for their response to a wide range of questions, CCTV for recording this forum, Fletcher Free Library for graciously hosting us, our moderator Tom McCone, our volunteers, and you, our audience, for your interest in this election. The League would like to remind you all to vote on Tuesday, November the 5th. But if you wish to vote early, ballots will be in the mail to all registered voters between September 23rd and October 1st. You can vote your ballot Mail it in to your town clerk, drop it off at your ballot drop box or at your town clerk's office, or take it with you to your polling place on election day. If you moved, changed your name, became a new citizen, or will turn 18 by November 5th, you will need to register. If you want to know more about your candidates, the League has a nonpartisan voter's guide at vote411.org. Every vote counts, and we know this to be the case in Vermont. So we urge you to make the effort, make a decision, make a difference, and vote. Thank you for coming here today, and have a good evening.